We usually make videos on soldiers from different historical eras. Crusaders, Legionnaires, and Spartans are all very fascinating. But peacetime is as exciting, and sometimes even more destructive. You all have probably seen the creepy costumes of the plague doctors. Glass eyes, beaks, long cloaks. The image of these guys is associated with something dark and cruel. But who are they really? Today, we will live a day in the shoes of a plague doctor and realize that in reality, they were cuties and were serving a good cause. Meet our guest, Harry Kane. The year is 1650 and he lives in the beautiful city of Edinburgh. Harry's occupation is a plague doctor. He lives on the outskirts of the city in a very rich house, which is full of expensive trinkets. At the local bar, Kane gets drinks for free, and even the church isn't sentencing Harry to be burned at the stake, despite his provocative appearance. Although let us remind you, it is the 17th century, and death by burning was still common. The reason is simple. The plague is still raging all over the continent, and Kane's job is to take care of this problem. And before we get to the details, let's lay a better picture of the situation. The plague is a terrible disease with an almost 95% mortality rate. At first, the person feels pain and inflammation in the lymph nodes. Then the nodes expand and the patient begins to have a fever. In the span of two to 12 days, an infected person may also encounter plague pneumonia and most likely dies. Inflamed lymph nodes look a certain way and such a tumor is called a bubon. This characteristic feature is the reason why medieval sources often call the plague bubonic. As you probably know, the best way to catch a plague is a rat's bite. But there is another much more deadly transmitter, fleas. They are small, they can jump and bite people, and what's worse, they can easily survive the plague. People also carry it. You can get infected both by coming into contact with the person and by airborne droplets. In our time, the plague is easily treated with antibiotic streptomycin or its analogs. But the first vaccine was tested only in 1934, so our ancestors had a hard time. Contrary to the stereotype, the plague is not just a medieval disease. There are mentions of it in the Bible, in the chapter on the war between Israel and the Philistines. But the hand of the Lord was hard on the people of Ashdod, and he sent excruciating growths on them through all the country of Ashdod. That's written in the Bible which of course explains the deadly effect of the plague as God's punishment. But from the description, we can guess that the growths are most likely bubons, and judging by the terrible death rate among people, we are most certainly talking about the plague. A bit later in our times, mass spread of diseases began to be called pandemics. The first pandemic is called Justinian and began in 551. Over the course of 30 years, it took more than 100 million lives. At that time, this was almost a third of the civilized world population. Since then, at various intervals, the plague has returned and done its terrible reaping. By 1352, another pandemic had taken 25 million Europeans, a third of the continent's population. This disease did not bypass Russia. While our Harry was resting in Edinburgh in 1650, infected fleas were slowly making their way to Russia. The epidemic of 1654 through 1655 took 700,000 lives. Moscow was half empty. Some died and some fled from the disease, thereby spreading it to other regions. Entire cities were dying out from the epidemic. During almost the entirety of human history, the plague has been with people, side by side, and even after the invention of vaccines. In India, during the period from early 20th century to 1963, the disease killed more than 12 million people. But in the USSR, advanced in terms of medicine, during the entire time of the country's existence, the plague took only 2,000 lives. The reason is simple. The USSR had its own plague doctors. Their work was strictly classified and respected. A network of institutions was set up to monitor the plague by checking rats and fleas from potentially dangerous countries. The network lives to this day, and thanks to the Soviet Union, the post-Soviet community does not suffer from the plague. Unfortunately, we can't say the same about 1650 Edinburgh, where our poor Harry Kane is located. The rich knowledge in medicine gained by Greeks and Romans was undone by the church, which considered it an ungodly activity. When sick, people first of all called the priest, thinking that doctors are some freaks. That's how we arrived at the insane mortality rates, which led to the existence of plague doctors like our Harry. The prayers did not help, and people realized that something needed to be done despite their love towards the church. And after hundreds of thousands of dead, medicine finally started progressing although the shift cannot be called drastic. 
Treatment was mostly done by guessing. Some cauterized wounds, others were practicing bloodletting, and especially smart ones smeared patients with leeches. We'll talk about the details later. In the meantime, let's move on to Harry's costume. The cloaks and masks of plague doctors we are so used to were not worn by all representatives of the profession. They were invented in 1619 with the efforts of the French physician Charles de Loma. It was he who created the equipment, and for centuries before that, doctors did their job in whatever they pleased. Our Harry is a good plague doctor, so he's dressed appropriately. Kane has a helmet on his head, which is actually a prototype of a gas mask. It completely covers the head and even protects the eyes with glass eyepieces. The same beak that makes the costume unique, in fact, has a useful function. First of all, the beak was filled with strong-smelling herbs and other medicines. Doctors worked with patients who didn't smell particularly well, and sometimes even with corpses, when it was necessary to simply not faint from the smell. Also, the part of the beak that came in contact with the nose was covered with a sponge with incense, and the doctor himself constantly chewed garlic. Let's move on to talk about the cloak, the main purpose of which is to protect the doctor's body. Harry, like everyone in his profession, didn't want to touch patients. Gloves, long fishing boots, and a walking stick helped. They used a cane to examine patients, cauterize wounds, and if necessary, fight off particularly violent ones. Was the plague doctor costume effective? In part, yes, because as we mentioned, the plague is usually transmitted by contact, so covering the body is very reasonable. In addition, Harry greases his clothes with fat and wax, which is genius in itself. The main vector of the disease is fleas, and they can't bite through such clothes. But garlic is absolutely useless and does not save you from the plague in any way. As well as the beak, as we mentioned, the plague is easily transmitted through the air. Therefore, the mortality rate among plague doctors was still high. What makes up the plague doctor's day? Let's start with specifying that there are several kinds of them. The first can be called scavengers. One of the most frequent tasks that our Harry was asked to do is the removal and burial of corpses. The deeply religious nobles forgot about religion and ceremonies, and often local lords from Edinburgh called doctors to take the dead and dump them somewhere in a ditch. And along the way, Harry could have taken anything from their homes. Greed was weaker than the survival instinct, and few people went into the homes of the dead. As a result, the plague doctors, in addition to removing the corpses, could take everything they wanted. That's why we mentioned in the beginning Kane's nice house and a lot of trinkets. Removing corpses was only part of his job, but there were doctors who did just that. Now let's move on to another type. The second type of doctors, to which our Harry belongs, are medics. These guys really tried to help, but found themselves in a harsh reality where medicine had stalled for 500 years. Such doctors also removed corpses, but along the way, they tried to cure patients. The most common method of treatment was opening an inflamed lymph node with a special scalpel and then cauterizing it. The problem was that there are usually a lot of inflamed nodes, and the operation is very painful. And besides, if you miss even a millimeter of the plague-stricken surface, all the efforts would have been for nothing. However, there have been successful cases of treatment in Harry Kane's career, but they also were met with the harsh reality. It was believed that if a person was cured, then God must have helped him. But if someone died, the doctor was to blame. Of course, the death rate exceeded the number of cured, and so our Harry lives on the outskirts and is considered an outcast. However, out of respect for the profession, they still pour him a free drink at the local bar, which in turn can result in a drunken fight with some upset relatives of the deceased. What can we say if until the 19th century, astrology was considered a real science and much more prestigious than medicine? In addition, some of the plague doctor medics resorted to extravagant methods of treatment, some fed the sick spiders, thinking that they absorbed the bad. Some made people smell horse poop to kill the plague with a stink. Especially smart people used cupping therapy, applied frogs, and treated the plague with leeches. But the third and the least common category of plague doctors are prophets. These guys were highly educated people who tried to use their genius to solve the problem. For example, the famous Nostradamus was a plague doctor. Predictions were his hobby, but in fact, Michel de Nostradam was a very gifted doctor. For his contribution to fight against the plague, the parliament of one of the regions of France even issued Nostradamus a lifetime pension. There were other guys like the surgeon Chaliac. After discovering that he had the plague, the guy isolated himself from society and for a whole week systematically cut and squeezed out the plague growths, cauterizing them. This worked, and de Chaliac tried to introduce the knowledge to a wide practice. Unfortunately, 
it didn't work very well. The ignorance towards Roman heritage and the cult of the church were not the only reasons. Total unsanitary was all over the world, and not washing for a couple of months was common. And dirt, as everyone knows, is the best friend of fleas. Plague doctors were one of the straws that the powerful clung onto to save their butts. And although they were not particularly liked, all cities needed them. So our Harry Kane was on a contract with the local mayor. The guy's monthly salary was an outstanding 110 pounds. For context, this is six and a half tons of beef, or 220 kilograms a day. An ordinary carpenter earned Harry's monthly salary in two years. For comparison, a whole year of renting an elite apartment on a central street of the city cost about 50 pounds. Even the lowest class of plague doctors had no problems with money. The only problem was to survive. Science still can't answer the question why, with such unsanitary conditions and zero medicine, the plague didn't kill the entire planet. The most popular theory is the development of immunity, basically a natural way to get vaccinated. Perhaps some people really caught the weakened plague and developed tolerance. Perhaps the plague has a limit of spreading. But maybe, just maybe, the plague doctors did their bit by disposing of corpses and maintaining at least some sense of sanitation. So our old Harry Kane was doing a good but dirty job at great risk to his life. It is possible that thanks to his treatments of one of our ancestors, we are alive today. Please leave a like for Harry under this video. And that's all we got. See you soon, friends.